AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of all elite wrestling. I'm one of the co-hosts, Aubrey Edwards, referee. I yell at dudes who play fight in their underwear on TV. And I'm joined this week once again by my amazing co-host who's been killing it on this podcast, Alex Everhentes. How are you doing, bud? I am doing fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's always so much fun. Yeah, it's uh, you're sl- you're slowly taking Tony's place. So uh, I, we might oh, have to have never. like a West Side Story battle at work. We're like, I'm <laughs> no, gonna stand in there no, like no. Maria, just watching the two groups fight. Like it's it's gonna be great. <laughs> we'll record it. It'll be a awesome. special edition. It'll be awesome. Uh, I don't I don't want to get into West Side Story. I want to get into our interview, who's an amazing, wonderful person, uh, Dasha Gonzalez. She's literally when I say like she's a ball of sunshine, I think that's like an understatement on a cloudy day right like she is (laughs) she is just one of the most pleasant and smiley and happy people that i've ever met and somehow when like the world is burning down and everything's on fire she's like well guys i think we're gonna be okay so welcome dasha to the podcast thank you thank you thank you aubrey well because aubrey i suffer from this thing called uh, chronic optimism and (laughs) i'm always looking for the positive because Lately, we've just been living in such a negative world. I mean, there's so much negativity, so much bad that's going on. But with all the bad, there's always good. So I'm like, you know what? I want my legacy to be a light in this world. And I'm glad to see that that's how it's coming off. Yeah, it's definitely a I think chronic optimism is a good thing to have in wrestling. Just because people I think a lot more people need to suffer from that. Exactly. Quite frankly, it's, it's a good. Condi- is it is it like viral? Can I catch it? Because um, <laughs> I think it is. Hopefully it could be communicable I and I could okay. just spread it to everyone. But if anyone needs any, they all know I will give them, I will transfer some of my optimism. And I think it. some people I'm giving, I'm giving it through, to, through the computer to you. There we go. I'm taking it. It's, it's going to be a start. Good start to my day. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, I want to start just because I'm the one asking the question. You and Billy Gunn have a very uh, interesting, long-lasting relationship, and uh, I have to deal with Billy Gunn's bullshit all the time on Dark. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, a lot. His line, not mine. <laughs> I was like, why do I end up working with you all the time? He's like, because you're the only one that deals with my bullshit. I'm like, yeah, that's fair. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about your relationship with Billy Gunn? Ooh, I've known Billy for, I'm willing to say, nine years now he actually was one of my coaches when i was in nxt and that's kind of how we developed the relationship and it's funny because as many people know he's like grumpy old man like grumpy <laughs> pants all the time and he's it legitimately was, an old man so <laughs> yeah, he, yeah well i remind him all the time because him and my mom were born the same year i'm like listen you're old enough to be my dad okay <laughs> and it but phew, man he looks great but on a side note, I, he was always so grumpy. And I'm like, man, I'm one of those people that's always like, when somebody's grumpy, I want to like figure out why. Why are they grumpy? Or at least share some of my positivity with them. And he would get so annoyed and it would just bring me so much joy. But at the same time, as much as he would say he didn't like it, I know he really enjoyed it and liked it. Uh, so he he was always one of those people of like, let's keep, you know, positive people around. I'm not going to let them know that I like them, you know, kind of mm-hmm. a thing. But that's how we mm-hmm. developed that friendship and relationship got close to his family go to like game nights at his house his wife paula is incredible she and it's funny because he's like you have the same optimism as paula and you two are like so similar i'm like yeah because you need that in your life and oh, you um, he he's an incredible human being and he's For so sure. knowledgeable about the industry and life in general because he's been through so much that he's like my adopted like work dad. And when I had gotten let go from WWE and like he had found out, he's like, oh, we need you because he was like the head coach at AEW at the time. And when I we had the pay-per-view in Daytona, which was Fighter Fest, and he's like, just come with me, come to the back. And like, I'm grateful for even getting into like AEW because it was because of Billy. Like he was the one that was like, come with me. They'd be, well, he likes to use choice words uh, if they didn't hire you. So he was just like, just come with me so they can see how awesome you are because we need you. And I'm eternally grateful for that. So let's, let's talk about that because listen, you're my sister from a different mister. Mm. <laughs> and we have been on this ride from day one, which is super exciting. So I remember uh, talking to QT And him telling me that you were going to be the other half of the Spanish commentary team. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I don't know much about her, but I knew from what I saw right away that we were going to click right away. And we did, right? Like, like day one, we were like, 
it's like we knew each other forever. So when did you find out that you were going to do Spanish commentary and kind of what were your initial thoughts about that? Well, I started off as like the timekeeper uh, for the first two like pay-per-views at AEW because I was in the back and they needed somebody to ring the bell and they're like, hey, can you ring the bell? And I was like, well, I used to ring the bell like at live events and stuff. It was on the floor. Now it's on a table, kind of out of my scope of practice, but I'll give it a try. And uh, and then QT and Cody had asked me like, hey, do you speak Spanish? Because I kept like on them like, hey, if you guys need anything, I can interview, I can ring an ounce, you know, whatever you guys may need. I'm here for you guys. Uh, and they had asked me the question, do you speak Spanish? And I'm like, yes. I was like, my See? mom would be really disappointed if I did it. And they're like, no, 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 no. You have to change your last name. But do you really speak Spanish? It's like what they told me. I was like, I guess. They're like, well, how would you feel about doing like Spanish commentary? And I was like, listen, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I've never even done English commentary. So it's going to be a learning curve for me, a learning process. If you guys are willing to allow me and entrust me with that, I will give it everything that I've got. And yeah, we hit it off right away. Had great chemistry. Um, we call each other Daleks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now we have... Yep. Now we- that's are us. we going to be, we have, we have Alvaro now, so we have to like change our name to like a trio. But I well, mean, we can we'll add an extra name, an extra A in there. And it could be Dallas. Because he's Alvaro, A-L. It yeah. all works out. It's meant to yeah. be. Look at that. That's true. That's true. But I mean, <laughs> probably a lot that I needed to know. I already spoke Spanish, still working on it because it's like a whole nother animal, like having to translate promos and having to translate everything. And we're literally talking the whole time yeah uh, and so having people in our ear right I, and, and that's actually one of the questions that i had and if you don't mind I, i'd love to just ask you that mm-hmm. are i don't think people understand how challenging it is for us to be able to do what we do because we have so many voices in our head and we're in real time and we're following what the english announced team is doing so th- tell us a little bit about that process because i think it'd be great to kind of enlighten some folks so they know oh my gosh this is crazy what these guys do Yeah. Sometimes, you know, on Twitter and social media, they eat us up alive. And we're just like, man, if you could only sit in this seat and understand what it is that we're doing, people, it's it's challenging (laughs) because you're calling the action that's right in front of you. At the same time, the truck is not they're relaying messages to English commentary of like, okay, we're going to commercial break or, oh, this is coming up. We've got this promo coming up. So we have the English feed just to to make sure that we're kind of on the same storyline and timing wise that English is going on. But at the same time, when, when promos and interviews and things like that are going on, the truck is giving feedback to English. So we're listening to that while we're still trying to listen to what's going on in front of us. And then in Spanish, for those that speak Spanish, a lot of the words are like mixed up and jumbled. And sometimes you have to listen to the sentence in order to be able to translate it. But at the same time, you've got five people going on in this year. Like it's very, very loud. You're listening to what it is. And then if it's like Darby or Malachi Black, those two <laughs> men have incredible promos. But at the same time, they the storytelling that they do, a lot of the idioms don't translate into Spanish. So you're trying to think, okay, what is this? What is that? Your brain's going crazy of like, what's this word? Ah, there's five different words, different donations. So like, it's very challenging. And then also Latin American Spanish is different than Mexican Spanish is different than Caribbean Spanish. So you're trying to find this neutral level of Spanish that's not going to offend one country, but woof, man, it's great. It's, it's hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life, but it's very rewarding when you do hear fans and you read their comments and they're like, you know, listening to you and Alex or the commentary team, you guys sound like you guys have a great friendship. You have great chemistry. You guys sound like you're having a conversation watching wrestling on your couch. So that's one of the biggest compliments for us. But whew, man, it is challenging. I would like to, you know, give anyone that thinks it's the easiest thing a second to try it because it's not easy. Like commentary <laughs> in and of itself, as you said, like, English commentary is already hard. I I listen into a lot of like commentary that happens on indie shows. And a lot of people think that it's, say, I get it a lot with refing too. You get a lot of armchair quarterbacks where people are like, oh, it's not that hard. You just stand there, right? It's like, you don't sit there and just tell people what's happening. Like you have to tell people the play by play. You have to give them the story. At the same time, you have to put the talent over anything you say. Like you can't bury the talent because your job is to help elevate the story and it's one of those things that like when commentary is good 
it only helps the product. So like I have mad respect for you guys, like not only doing commentary, but being able to take someone else's commentary and then turn it in your own and add to it. Like so, so freaking good. You guys are the freaking best. Uh, speaking of good, one of the things I really like about Dasha is she's one of the hardest working people that I see at AEW, including the fact that she is there uh, as early as possible to go to Dustin Rhodes training uh, that happens before call time, which eventually led to you wrestling in the uh, women's tournament, the Deadly Draw. So how did that come about? Oh, that was, I mean, when I started in the wrestling, like, industry, the business. I mean, I was training. That's what I wanted to do was be a wrestler. Then I was given the opportunity to host and announce. So I kind of, it was kind of one of those things that even still to this day, like it still hurts me and it pains me because I was a national competitive gymnast. I swam, I dove, I wrestled. I'm an athlete. That's what I love to do. But then it's like, okay, well, I love this industry. If wrestling doesn't work out, I need to be able to wear another hat and find another way to stay in the industry. And it's helped me, you know, in AEW, but having that opportunity, I remember when I was just told, hey, how do you feel about, you know, being Rachel Ellering's partner in the tournament? I was like, are you kidding me? Of course I'm going to do it. And it was just such an honor that AEW even trusted me to be able to even to compete. And that day was wild because we were in the midst of COVID and everyone mm-hmm. was getting tested. Um vaccines were like slowly coming out, but they weren't readily available to everyone. And I had told myself, man, if I ever have the opportunity to wrestle, I want to just be able to focus on wrestling. Well, the world had other plans for me that day (laughs) because I was doing interviews. I was doing Spanish commentary. I was hosting pre-show and doing five different things, calling dynamite in my, in my ring gear. And, and then had to go figure out what I was going to do in the match and then immediately go out for the match. But I mean, it goes to show one of the things, as long as you're willing to constantly learn and stay involved and evolve in the industry and you can wear as many hats as possible, you're always going to find something fun to do. And that has been probably one of the highlights of of my career here at AEW it was one moment, but hoping it could come back maybe <laughs> again. But until then, I will happily do whatever AEW needs me to do. And Joshua, what was the moment that hit you? Because I mean, for a lot of us, there were certain moments or maybe there was a certain time in our life where we realized, you know what? The pro wrestling business, that's what I want to do. That's what I love. That's what I want to get into. Did you have that kind of moment in your life? Um, growing up, I, I was like a casual fan with my dad and my brothers. We'd always play around, but I knew growing up, I always wanted to work in entertainment. I wanted to have a job where I could be physically fit and active. I could travel. I could see the world. So it was kind of one of those things that like wrestling was it. I wasn't like a crazy diehard fan. Like I'm not like Tony or like Dax that like know all these stats and can remember anything and everything like that's fascinating. But the way that it made me feel as a fan was kind of what I wanted to do in my future, in my career. Like I studied molecular biology or microbiology. I have a science degree. I was going to go get a doctorate in physical therapy, which is funny because I was also pre-dental, like pre-medical is what I was when I was in, in college. But I always knew that I wanted to work in entertainment, but it's kind of one of those things like musicians, it's a hit or miss. You never know what's going to happen. So you need to have something to fall back on because you still got to pay the bills. And um, I always just knew I was watching, It's I, I hate to mention it, but at the same time, it, I was watching Total Divas and like watching some of the, the girls. And I was like, Eva Marie was, was ring announcing one day or something like that. And it was like a total like bomb. And I was like, man, I could do this kind of a thing. So I started figuring out, okay, well, let me find wrestling schools. Let me find ways to, to get into the industry. And I applied online and I didn't have as hard of a time as a lot of other people, but I realized that and was grateful and just worked my tail off in order to learn as much as possible and continue in the industry. And I'm coming up on eight years now, which is pretty cool. That's insane. We're talking to Dasha on AEW Unrestricted about how she got into AEW and coming up, all of the incredible things that led her into wrestling. And we are back. You're right here in AEW Unrestricted. Alex Aubrey and Dasha Gonzalez one half of Daleks, one half of the Spanish commentary team, announcer, ring announcer. I could keep going on overall. Fantastic person. So excited to have her. This is so cool, Dasha, because 
you and I, you know, we started together at the Spanish announce desk. We started doing the pre-show on like my Facebook page. Do you remember yep. that? Yep. Where we're like, I had this idea of like, we should really do a pre-show. And then we just started doing it randomly. And then all of a sudden we manifested it to actually be the pre-show. And then yep. we get a chance every week to do this, which is just so much fun. But I want to ask you about the moment that you found out that you're going to be doing your first backstage interview. And then when you're going to be doing ring announcing and what those moments were like, do you remember specifically? Ooh backstage interview was like this is my time for redemption <laughs> <laughs> most people didn't think i had a personality at the other place that i worked at they thought i was a robot and I was like, <laughs> if you ever went to a live event or you ever went to anything you saw i was not a total dud and i did have a personality i just was kind of restrained and wasn't allowed to be myself so it was one of the most refreshing things because the first time I did an interview, it was one of those things I was like, okay, hey, I'm waiting for the script. Guess what? There was no script. So I was like, I can speak with the words I have inside of my brain. I can ask a logical question that this person can articulate an answer to. And it was amazing because I could feel that like there was a little bit of hesitation because it, this was a crew that only saw me fail on TV, you know, before. So they were putting a lot of trust in me and I'm like, you know what, but I can do it. Just trust me. I can do it. And I got to go live and ask, you know, a question that had came up. It went through just perfectly fine. And I was able to nod and I was able to slightly react, not overreact to the question that I was asking. And people were like, oh, wow, she is human. Yes, I am, people. I am a human being. I have emotion. I'm a Hispanic woman that talks with my hands a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Often hits me during commentary, too, because of those wow. hands. Just a little when FYI, I little backstage moment there for you. <laughs> but the whole hosting, announcing, and ring announcing, I had never in my life ever announced live on TV. So Double or Nothing was the first time that I was entrusted with ring announcing for AEW, a full show. No fans in the audience, but we were live on Fight TV. We were live on regular TV. And I was like, oh, I was so nervous. I was wearing like a turtleneck and long sleeve dress. It was like super hot, probably like 103 degrees in Jacksonville. Yep. Oh, but I got through it. And I was like, it was from that moment that I felt that AEW was like, wow, this girl can actually do stuff. We can trust her. And I've been able to announce dark in Orlando. And anytime an emergency has happened, I have to bring like five different outfits with me on TV because I never yep. know what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> but it's I feel so blessed to be able to for people to to feel that they can count on me. And I just I feel so good. <laughs> Honestly, I feel so happy and excited. One of the things I absolutely loved is back when we had the Atlanta tapings, when suddenly we found out everything was shutting down and we had to drive five, six hours from Jacksonville to Atlanta and tape. Like, whoops, sorry. <laughs> uh, when we uh, when we had to drive to Atlanta and tape like six episodes of TV in 24 hours or whatever, and it was just insane. And Dash is just like, yep, okay. Well, I'm wearing the same dress because I don't know when these are going to air. They might edit them all together. And all of a sudden, it's just like, boom. And I think you're the way you're approaching this, like just being dependable and being able to be adaptable to whatever the situation is, because obviously none of us knew that was going to happen. And we just kind of had to go, OK, this is this is the reality. This is what we're doing. We're just going to make it happen. And uh, I, I was I remember being thoroughly impressed with your individual performance that day because it was just like man she's we've all just been thrown in the fire and now she's just suddenly got to kill it because she's the one who's kicking off all these matches so great job i love you i appreciate <laughs> it i was literally like a nervous wreck inside and i was just like just keep it together on the outside don't let oh anything. we all were like, no we sell it, all no were <laughs> and, and i actually was speaking of billy was i we drove like seven hours to, to <laughs> to Atlanta together in a car, him and his grumpy mood. He's like, you, I'm going to need you to not talk a lot. And I was like, okay, I'm going to put my headphones in. I'm going to bring my iPad. I'm going to download all sorts of movies. And then at one point they're like, why aren't you talking? I was like, you told me to shut up. <laughs> but that it was sounds about right. <laughs> 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 on the way over. But yeah, no, it was, 
that was the, I would say the time when AEW, those of us that were like already on the roster bonded the most because we're like, okay, we're in this together. We don't know what's going to happen. We'll figure it out. Like we will figure it out. And we did. And look at us now. <laughs> Let me so ask you, Dasha, angry. did did your preparation, because before all this, you were a pageant queen, right? So yeah. you had all of this experience and preparation. And did all of that help you get to where you are now? Did that prepare you for, for this crazy world Absolutely. that we live in? Absolutely. 1000%. So it's funny because people are like, oh, you were a pageant queen. I was like, I didn't do my first pageant until I was 19 because that's how I funded my undergraduate education. I wasn't like a pageant baby that did it when I was kid, a kid or anything like that I did one just to see like if it was if the girls were super catty, if everyone was mean, like <laughs> kind of did it as a joke to see what it was like. I ended up winning like Miss Florida teen when I was 19 because like the cutoff was like 18. But like my birthday was this weird situation. They like, ended up winning. I was like, whoa, these women are very intelligent and I can use this money to pay for school. And then I competed in the Miss America organization. And it, it was the interviews, the public speaking that most definitely helped me get over stage, right? It helped me be able to perform interviews. It helped me be able to host shows. And all that, those four years that I competed in pageants, I didn't know that it would prepare me so much for my future. And I use so much of everything that I learned from competing to be able to even do Spanish commentary, to interview, to host, to ring announce, the whole projecting that is involved with ring announcing. So it was a, a huge blessing in disguise because not only did my undergraduate education get paid for and I graduated debt free, but all these life skills connections that I learned competing now have me right here <laughs> i think that's uh it, like how you're saying like oh they're probably all catty because like in my mind uh beauty pageants are exactly like miss congeniality where everyone's either catty or ditzy yeah. and it's just like what's the best day of what's your ideal date all that kind of stuff april uh, 23rd because all you need is a light sweater all you need is a light jacket but oh I was my god bullock in like pageant land where i was like i will protect you nobody's gonna mess with you kind of a thing like that that was me i was saying i'm gonna show you how to beat someone up it's uh, yeah yep. no i definitely <laughs> see you as that person what was uh what was the thing you found most surprising about pageants hmm i would say the whole the, the way that the girls like carried themselves yeah a lot of them were nervous but like Oh, like my, like I was saying, going into it, I thought that they would like literally sabotage you and try and find any way for you not to win, to trip, to like rip up your dress or something like that. When the girls were super supportive growing up, huge tomboy. Like my mom would always ask me to be more girly. Like even still to this day, like when I'm not at work or not on camera, like I've got my hair in a ponytail, gym clothes, no makeup on. And, and it was one of those things like, I never really had that female like connection. I never had like girls that were my friends growing up. So I felt very uncomfortable going into it when actually the girls were not all about drama and things like that. Cause I can be in the Miss America's Miss America organization and the girls were all in college. You had to be in college or have a full-time job in order to compete. And a lot of them were so career oriented and goal focused that I was like, Oh, I really like this. And I don't really know how to talk to girls and do all this girl stuff. And it helped me with that. So that was the most shocking. So I was like, Oh, you're not a jerk. <laughs> you're actually really cool and nice and great mentors. Like a lot of the women that volunteered to put on the pageants, like the executive directors, they didn't get paid for it. They just, Literally, it was it was it was woman empowerment, essentially, is what it was. And I'm always here and down for that. I was like, oh, I can support this. Well, along the lines of your pageant world and then obviously getting into the professional wrestling world, let's shift gears and talk about Titan Games, because yes. it seems like everything was leading up to this particular moment. So how did this all come about? Tell us about your experience. And then you have to share with everyone out there the voicemail that The Rock left you, at least yes. tell him tell him what he said, because that was so cool when you shared it to me. And I thought that was so cool. And I, and I could just see the joy in your face. I thought that was such a cool moment for you. So Titan Games, I saw like The Rock's call to action on social media. And I was like, ooh, that seems really cool. And at the time I was with, you know, the other company and I was only allowed, like I wasn't even allowed to train in the ring because God forbid something happened to me and I couldn't do my job. I'd get in a lot of trouble. So I saw Titan Games. I, you know, did 
the rocks call to action, submitted the videos, got on the show for like season one. And I like went over to my boss and was like, Hey, I have this opportunity. I'd really love to do it. Me being the athlete that I am not being able to get that like extra energy out. I was like, I want to do something. I, I need to compete. I need to do something. If it can't be in the ring, then I'm going to do it on my own time. And I had a scheduling conflict that didn't work out. And I was like, man, this is like, I'm super bummed and it makes me like super angry that I can't do it. So I was like, I'll do a fitness competition. Ended up rupturing my Achilles tendon, was mm -hmm. out for almost a year. And I was like, man, I didn't get to do a tie-in game. I got let go from a job. I have an injury. Like it was not a fun time. But me being the optimist that I am, I'm like, everything happens for a reason. Okay. There's a reason why I didn't get this opportunity. Doesn't mean the door is completely closed. If there is a second season I have this injury I'm recovering from. It'll be like the closure, the finish to my injury. So now I have a goal of something I could work up to. So I trained my hardest. There was a season two that happened. I resubmitted my stuff. I ended up getting on the show as an alternate. I didn't actually get on the show immediately. The day before I'm flying out, because I was like, okay, as an alternate, if anything, something good can happen. I could meet with a, a network rep and host. Something happens. I'll be there and I can like make up for it, you know? And Golden Boy was one of the uh, the commentators for the okay. show. And like I saw Carrie Champion was like one of the interviews from the season prior. I was like, God forbid anything happens to anyone. I can be there. I can interview. I can do commentary and ended up getting on the show. And for me, it was one of the coolest, most hardest things ever. Cause I was, I was about 80% recovered from my Achilles. I still didn't have all of the strength in my right calf. And I was just, everyone thought I I'm willing to say everyone thought, oh man, she's just going to bomb. She's just a pretty face. She's just going to look good on camera and not make anything of it. But if there's one thing that my mom and my dad taught me is to never give up, no matter if all odds are stacked against you. I went on my first challenge. It was like, it was a, uh, like a one where you had to knock these walls in the air. I was like, I was a gymnast. I know how to fly in the air. I know how to get these puppies down. The second one was a tug of war one. I struggled a little bit with like trying to get the rope. But at the end of the day, it was one of those things like we were on. And I was like, I'm not going to give up till I get, you know, the center box over to my side. Ended up winning the second one. And I made it to Mount Olympus, Mount Olympus going up because I still can't even till this day, almost three years post can't even walk on my tippy toes all the way. So like trying to carry this like 150 pound log thing up, I was like, my leg could not make it happen, but I wasn't going to give up. And then in redemption round, the two other girls like had it won. And it's one of those like testaments to like perseverance. Don't, it's not over till it's over kind of a thing. I kept going and going, going. And as weird as this may sound, I was like, I know how to climb that pole <laughs> to get up there and pull the lever. <laughs> <laughs> and Crazy. they were going upside down. I was like, you just have to go on top of it. And I was able to go from last place all the way to first place. So that was one of like the coolest things and coolest experiences ever, because we were like working out all day long, doing all these challenges and getting I, like after the show had wrapped and finished, I made it to the regional finals, but uh, obviously didn't win the show. And the one thing my mom always taught me to do and even pageants taught me to do was just make sure that people know how grateful you are for the experience. And so I just went like on Instagram, wrote, you know, the rock a message. I'm like, this man's never going to see this, but thinking, you know, the production company, thinking a whole bunch of people that worked through the show, you know, for the experience. And it was probably like two or three months after I got like a message from him, you know, saying how proud he was of me and, mm -hmm. Um, how hard I worked and like how, like, I, I honestly just couldn't believe that he would take time out of his day to send me like a two minute message. Like that's what kind of a stand up guy. Mm -hmm. wrong. And it was so genuine. I, I remember you played it to me and I was even moved just by how authentic he was and how genuinely grateful and passionate he was that you were a part of this show. It was so right. cool. And he thanked me for like representing wrestling. And I was just like, I was just so shocked. He's like, it's, it's, it's so good to have somebody like you representing the wrestling industry and just like not giving up. It doesn't matter who you are, or where you come from, like you gave it your all. And I, and that's how I felt like I did. And it was nice to see that he recognized that and everyone there recognized that. So I'm just, even still to this day, I'm like so grateful for it. I want to know just, 
personally because I'm fascinated by it. And I had chatted with you a little bit because I was watching Titan Games, super excited for you and all that. Uh, we're live on Dynamite, which is very different than, say, when we tape Rampage. What would you say was the biggest difference in the television production aspect between doing something like Titan Games and doing something like a live wrestling show? It's funny that you mentioned that because I'm still huge friends with a lot of the people I competed with. We have this like text chain where we literally text each other all week long and they would give us a schedule and I would tell and they're like, all right. And a lot of the people were like, you know, military personnel or like in law enforcement. So they're used to like regimented schedules. And I'm like, hey, guys, I come from TV land. This schedule is non-existent i was like mm-hmm. we're not live tv we don't have to be on from eight to ten i said they can retape and do anything and everything you think it's gonna take you know five hours mm, i'm willing to say it's gonna take double that and that was the most shocking thing for them so actually working on dynamite and rampage rampage is pre-taped we do go live a lot of times but it's generally pre-taped and dynamite It's like, you got to get it on the first try. There's only one time to get it done. You're here live from eight to 10 and that's it. There's no redoing anything. So the difference was we were there from super early in the morning till early in the morning, the next night, get a few hours of sleep and back to the same thing. And a lot of them were like, this is wild. This is crazy. And with Titan Games, the crew was moving different apparatuses. I'm like, and those are like mechanical things. Things fail sometimes and you have to fix things. Sometimes things don't work out that way. And so I was fine because I was already prepped for that working in television. Cause I'm like, it's hurry up and wait. You're waiting all day long, trying to stay as warm as possible. And then it's like, all right, go get your things. You got to go, go perform. And People got hurt because they didn't understand how to keep their bodies warm and how to be able to perform on cue that fast. Um, but I lucked out because I was like, yeah, you guys think this is going to happen? It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever consider doing another reality show or competition Absolutely. show? Absolutely. I had so much fun. After the fact, we were joking around because with some of the people, I'm like, man, we should go like on like the tag challenge or we should do like floors lava or something like that. Like I'm a huge Ooh. athlete. Anything that involves high risk and danger, like that's my middle name. I'm an adrenaline junkie at race cars, a race goat cart. So any sort of like reality show like that, I would in a heartbeat do it. Oh man, this is, this is fascinating. I love you, Dasha. This is so great. <laughs> We're talking to Dasha on AEW Unrestricted and coming up, we have fan questions. Woo-hoo. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey and Alex here with the great and wonderful and sunshine Dasha Gonzalez. We're here with fan questions. Thanks for everyone who submitted these on Twitter. We're going to start with just a snap from Twitter. Uh, I'd like to know who some of your favorite wrestlers are and who you particularly like to do commentary for. In AEW, who my yes. favorite wrestler? Oh my gosh! Sure. So I am I am probably one of the biggest Chris Statlander fans. Oh yeah. She doesn't get enough credit. I mean, she is mm. so talented. As a former gymnast myself, um, I always have loved her style of wrestling, the strength that she has. So she, I would probably say her. And obviously, I love all my Latinas, whether they're good good guys or bad guys. I'm always going to support my Latinas. But um, there's just something cool about Chris. You know, I don't know what it is. She's just such a kind human being. She's so intelligent and and such a hard worker. And having to watch like her knee kind of give out at the beginning, but then watching her kind of grow and become stronger and more agile, more powerful, like the sky's the limit for her. I just can't wait to, to watch her continue to grow. So currently right now, I would probably say Chris, but I mean, I'm a sucker for our women's champion, Thunder Rosa, Diamante, Mm -hmm. like Red Velvet, like our roster, everyone has something that's special about themselves. So when people ask me, what's your favorite? I'm like, but everyone has something that's my favorite. Yeah, it's hard to choose for sure. So hard. So speaking of our great talent roster and speaking of Titan Games, Phil Cataldo wants to know which wrestler in AEW do you think would be best on Titan Games? Ooh, I mean, I'm going to go back to Chris. 
like back to Chris, because she is so strong, she is so agile, uh, having competed on Titan games, when it comes to Titan games, it's not necessarily the person that's the strongest or the person that, that's the fastest. I would say it has to be the most well-rounded athlete. You have to have strength. You have to have endurance. You have to have flexibility. And I, Chris would dominate that show. We have a question from Aubrey Edwards, uh, not on Twitter, but uh, from this exact moment. Uh, I know you've had a number of guests on commentary. This is something we totally didn't talk about earlier because I know during the pandemic, we've had people kind of cycle in and out. At, it was very, very long days. Is there anyone in particular that we haven't named yet that you've really enjoyed doing commentary with? Thunder Rosa was so much fun on commentary. She is so very well spoken and getting the the perspective that she has of like being a champion at that time. She wasn't a champion in AEW quite just yet, but getting I don't her think she was even signed. She was not. No, she no, wasn't. Fully signed. That's right. She wasn't Good fully call. signed. But she's so goal driven and constantly like working like the woman doesn't stop. And she's like, hey, if I don't have a match, if I don't have anything, I'm more than happy to help you guys. Her and we had Ray Phoenix with us a few times, too. And that was so much fun because a lot of people don't hear him talk, but he's very soft spoken. But when it comes to commentary, because he's been wrestling for such a long time, he's so articulate. He can let you know, like, man, this is what it feels like. And having been in the ring with a lot of those wrestlers. He gives you a different perspective that we can't bring to the show. So just having those wrestlers that are fluent in Spanish, I felt like it really helped elevate a lot of our commentary because we got such a different side. Along your question, Aubrey, on the air, Alex actually has a quick question that he has to sneak in as well. (laughs) Dasha, what is your favorite AEW entrance song to jam out to while we're doing Spanish commentary? Oh, Ooh, oh, um, <laughs> oh, I, would you say it's my favorite or my favorite to translate? No. Oh, uh, OK. Fair enough. Fair enough. Either, your choice. Your choice. <laughs> we have this thing on Spanish <laughs> where we don't we don't put it on the air, but we privately do it. And um, I like to translate um, CM Punk. CM Punk. So- Ah. (laughs) into spanish Uh and i love to sing judas Judas. and we just like to sing and meow to many of the songs now the boys don't meow to the songs but i will meow to the songs we also uh always consistently since day one uh sing shots 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 when when private party comes out that's one of our all-time songs to jam out to and physically get up and dance every time they come out this is true and i like things to people do alex. not see i love to all to bother alex and tell him man you're three years later you're still waiting for that invitation that you'll never get in the mail <laughs> exactly although now we passed a long time about one. what's that i said i got mine you I'm did. allowed a plus one, but yeah. I don't know if you're cool enough to come. <laughs> mm, mm. Oh, I love fun this. times. I'm going to have to look for you guys the next time I'm standing in a ring and just look over and see like when, oh, you'll see when us. private parties coming out where you guys just stand up and boogie. Like, how have I missed this? Like, we've done like 140 episodes of TV. Oh, this yeah. Is like we... compl- this is breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we lip sync. We throw a party. We oh, just yeah. Every time. Chairs. We just jam out. Yep. All the time. I like... I like learning that Dasha is the Taz of Spanish commentary where she just does uh, her rendition of people's entrance music. Oh, now so all of a sudden, true. Oh, now all of a sudden people are going to be like, okay, now I got to listen to the Spanish track because I heard Taz's rendition. I want to see Dasha and Taz at karaoke and just like, have a competition. This would be Let's so great. It. We're going to make it happen. We're going to oh, make yeah. it happen. Uh, we have a question from Cleo's dad, Matt. We love seeing Dasha in the women's tag tournament. What are the chances you get back in an AEW ring and compete? Listen, if it was my choice, it would be happening. Unfortunately, that's above (laughs) my pay grade, but I still continue to practice and am ready for the opportunity. It's all about opportunity. 
You can't sit there and like have a boo boo face and like be crying that it's not happening. It's just be ready and prepared. I always bring my ring gear with me. I always have my boots ready, laced up. And it's just the moment when they're like, hey, can you do this? Sure. Why not? As long as we have coverage and other things. And that's the cool thing about like Spanish now having three people, especially Alex, for example, when your alter ego, you know, goes out to help Penta Oscuro, we all work together and are able to wear many hats. And that's one of the beauties of AEW is we have that opportunity and that luxury of being able to do that. But if given the opportunity, oh, you don't even have to ask me twice. I'm there. I'm ready. I'm already lacing up. Well, let's uh, let's chat about some of the other things that we chat about when we're not on air at Spanish Commentary. Food. So Hank Coppin wants to know, what's your favorite cheat meal? Ooh. So a lot of people tell me that this is not a meal and it's not fair because I beg to differ. They're like, this is not a meal, but I love soup. Soup is like my favorite thing. I usually judge. I've heard this and I'm like, that's that's like water that's flavored. <laughs> I'm with Aubrey. You can you can have them in so many different ways. You can have a light broth. You can have it more hearty. Like I love soup. It's like my favorite thing ever. Give me a chicken tortilla soup. Give me anything. I love soup. So that is like usually my go to cheat. I love it. Uh, we have a question from my buddy Nat. Uh, when you're on the road, what are your top five places that you like to visit? Uh, children's museums, science museums, math museums, any museums. I love all the museums. I like if there's a beach, I'll try to go to the beach because the beach is like my favorite place ever. But oh, yeah. um, being the huge science nerd that I am, like I'm going to go check out the dinosaurs. I'm going to go mess around with uh, I love museums. That's my favorite thing. So I would say, yeah, museums, beaches. I'm not a huge foodie because I'm always, you know, trying to watch my figure. It's hard, very, very hard on the road. But um, yeah, museums and like Amanda, she's one of my museum goers. Her mega, we love science and dinosaurs. So that's that's our main thing. Five, that's a lot. I don't know, we're, not in, we're not in towns long enough to have five things that we do. <laughs> Good point. Unless you count sleep, eat, work out, work, and then you've got time for one more. <laughs> and that's it maybe this is maybe true. so francisco ortiz wants to know what's one major goal you'd like to accomplish here in AEW? i would definitely like to have something that's not necessarily mine but like something where it's like okay you think of interviews you think of tony shivani when you think of uh, different people like jr commentating legend i would like to have something whether it's a show or wrestling in the ring something that, that i'm known for because i wear so many hats but it's like what is that one thing that is yours and that's what i'm still working on trying to figure out you know i'm grateful that i get to wear so many hats but what is the one thing that's gonna that dasha gonzalez is going to be known for in aew what is your legacy type thing yes other what than that being that spreading cheer <laughs> Well, even then, that's a fantastic legacy to have, right? Like, sure is. You want people to be able to talk about you like for years and just say, man, Dasha was just so nice. And jo Dasha was just so caring. And Dasha was so good at literally everything that just got thrown at her. Because not everyone can pull that off. Not everyone can like, it's a sink or swim thing. And Dasha just always swims. I love it. Try, love it. I try. Uh, so one of the one of the questions we have is from from the magic of wrestling, of course, like we've been kind of touching on this. How do you juggle all of these hats? <laughs> I live my life one day at a time. I used one to quarter mile at a time. <laughs> yeah, seriously, like we always quote that because we're the only two that really love Fast and Furious. <laughs> uh, um, excuse me. <laughs> I'm saying me. you, you and I. <laughs> right. You and I are like and the only two. Everyone's like, what's wrong with you guys? And we're like, listen, we live our life a quarter mile at a time because we get so many things thrown at us. And it's kind of the way you have to do it. I used to get bent out of shape when things would constantly change. But as much as you try to plan everything like your it's live tv for us on wednesdays you never know what can happen you never know if somebody's going to be sick or their plane doesn't make it in so you you just have to be malleable and be easy to work with because pitching a fit that things didn't go your way it's that's not the way to do it you just have to take a deep breath in and breathe out and i always tell alex and Anne about that like inala Exana. There's nothing we could do as, as frustrated as we are because we're all juggling 50,000 things. So it's like when you get overwhelmed, you just have to stop and just breathe. 
It's so do. true. It's such good advice. And I think with that advice, we got to end this wonderful interview. I could talk to you for, for hours, Dasha. You're just such an incredible person. You have such an amazing backstory. And just you're you're a light of every single Wednesday. Every time I see you, I'm just like, yes, this is great. Dasha's here. Everything's going to be okay. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank Alex for co-hosting yet again. Of course. Tony Schiavone's like just dicking around at home. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Playing with his dog. I think, whatever, he hit the, but... he, I think he hit the mega millions. I think that's what's going on. He's just, uh, you know, kayfaving us. That's We're it. just going to start a rumor that he's like out in the forest fighting bears now. And it's just like Ooh, he's too like busy that. for us. Right? I like it. Him, <laughs> the adventures of Tony and Bug just out in the woods fighting bears. Anyway, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, you can follow Dasha on Instagram and Twitter at Dasha Corret. You can listen and follow this podcast on all of your favorite podcast platforms, Apple Music or whatever the hell it is now, uh, <laughs> Google, you, uh, whatever app. Just, just literally just like search AEW Unrestricted. You can find it. And then go on YouTube and search AEW Unrestricted. We've got new episodes on Monday where you can see all of our beautiful faces uh, talking about all the wonderful, amazing things we touched on today. You can see Dynamite on Wednesdays and Rampage on Fridays, Elevation on Mondays, uh, Dark on Tuesdays, and you can listen to Dasha's soothing voice, uh, both on Spanish commentary and singing uh, entrance musics. Mm -hmm. uh, that, apparently they don't play that yet, but um, we're all going to make the case that like this, this all has to air because it's great. I want to see you and Taz and karaoke. This was awesome. I'm Aubrey Edwards with Alex Abrahentes. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted.